right. All right. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the um, GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee, also known as the GAPFAC Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee Meeting. I'm Stephanie Hardison. I'm the Deputy Designated Officer. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted to our website with all relevant meeting materials. Um, before we get started, there will be a time for any relevant comments or statements towards the end for um, from the public. So please hold uh, comments until that, that period. We'll now open the meeting up for the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee by taking roll. All right, Gail Bassett, Daryl Daniels, I know he's here. Um, Nicole Darnell. Present. Yeah, Mark Hayden. Mr. David Malone. Here. Ann Rung. Stephen Schooner. Kristen Seaver. Present. And Clyde Thompson. Present, teacher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Roll has been taken. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to our uh, subcommittee chair. Yeah, so uh, uh, president for Daryl, by the way. Great. And it looks like we've had someone else join us uh, with with uh, an, an anonymous name. If we could change that so that we know who's in the room, that would be really helpful. So, yes, um, Nicole Darnell, um, chair of the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee, I'm really, really pleased to be opening this meeting today and welcoming David Gill, who is joining us. We have been on this path for the last several weeks, it feels like perhaps a couple of months, looking at ways in which we can automate decisions within GSA to help um, embed and advance sustainability within the federal acquisition workforce. It has necessarily led us down a path in exploring the opportunities around technologies and through a series of focus groups that started with EPA, we became aware of some parallel conversations and discussions that were happening in other agencies across the federal government, one being the Internal Revenue Service. And David, that is what has brought us to you. And I just want to welcome you and express my, my strong pleasure that you are here and able to talk with us about the innovative activities that are happening within IRS. Um, I will, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on David. He's a government contracting officer and data scientist. He is serving as chief analyst and technology solutions branch acting in the Department of Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, in the Office of Procurement, and, uh, and the, within the IRS, I'm stumbling on this, within the IRS, the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. Um, you're presently um, the contracting officer signing IRS and Treasury contracts for information technology and tax administration. And what has us, what has particularly piqued our interest is this, um, the published material that you've been advancing around topics related to in um, environmental impacts and sustainability, your new paper on the implementation of environmentally sustainable procurement policies in particular, and your in-depth analysis of sustainable procurement policies and associated contract award data. It's our understanding you've been involved in opportunities related to artificial intelligence and other automated automation approaches. And uh, we're just really eager to talk with you today about what you have learned. So welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm actually a, a former contracting officer, so I'm no longer signing contracts, but um, I'm in an analytics and technology role, but um, I, I'm embedded in, in the procurement space. Um, so I, I look at like new ways to use innovative tech um, for procurement goals such as sustainability. So you jumped right into our first question and it's to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. So you're looking at innovative tech as it relates to sustainability and, and, and other aspects or just sustainability? Uh, uh, other aspects to um, small business or uh, okay. category management to how the government selects vendors, which is called like source selection and uh, contractor responsibility. So 
um, it, it really like anything under the sun in, in the in the federal procurement space. Um, it, how I approach these problems um, it is informed by my experience. Uh, I've also been a, a supervisory IT specialist. Um, I've been a contracting officer's representative. And what it means to be a representative, it means you have a different job than being a contracting officer. Um, and, and you sort of represent the contracting officer, but you actually work in a different office uh, and you're closer to the, the program or the project. Um, I've also worked in, in our uh, chief data officer organization. Uh, so it's kind of like a combination of those experiences. Um, in, in the last few years, like uh, I've dipped more into like the academic world Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've got several papers uh, published through uh, the, the Navy's Acquisition Research Symposium. Fantastic. We have heard through EPA and others about your efforts to use artificial intelligence and other technologies to automate work within the IRS. Can you, can you walk us through the problems that you're trying to solve for and for whom you're trying to solve those problems? Okay. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you give an example. Uh, so clauses, these are like this boilerplate um, legal language that, that goes into contracts. And um, it is something that, that can be overwhelming for the acquisition workforce uh, because we have the, the federal acquisition regulations and then we have agency policy, uh, which is really the same setup uh, at most agencies, including GSA. Um, so I think between the federal acquisition regulations in my agency, it's about um, 1,000 clauses. And, and we can't just dump them all uh, into every contract. If we're hiring computer programmers, it, it, they think we were a little nutty if we included construction clauses in their contract. Uh, it wouldn't be a very easy contract to understand. Um, so we got to identify uh, which clauses are applicable. And I really didn't like the way that traditional contract writing systems handled it. Uh, also known as like e-procurement systems, um, because I thought either those systems were unhelpful in terms of when it came to causes, uh, or to the extent they helped, like it was very burdensome. Um, it, I've seen some systems where they would try to ask the user every possible question that could have a bearing on causes. And then the it became like the world's longest survey. Um, it would start out innocuously enough, like what's the dollar value of the contract? Is it fixed price or cost reimbursement? Uh, but then you went down this rabbit hole. It would be questions about intellectual property and if there were international trade agreements that applied, um, uh, then it, wh whether the work was inside the US or outside the US. Uh, and then once you got to FAR Part 23, um, then there's the question of, uh, so there's different causes. Uh, there's recovered materials. There's a couple of causes for bio-based. Uh, there's some causes for energy efficiency, and it, it, it's kind of overwhelming for the workforce in that these are complicated programs managed by different federal agencies. Um, and you, as a buyer, you're, you're a generalist. Um, I bought IT hardware, I bought software, I bought IT systems, uh, mm -hmm. but I've also done contracts with Wall Street law firms, uh, firearms purchases. Uh, so you can really buy anything that agency needs. Um, and, and procurements are especially diverse at GSA because um, GSA has really like a huge amount of spend um, and, and they do reimbursable work uh, through like GSA FedSim and other similar programs uh, for a lot of different agencies. So the, the contracting officer may not have like commodity or, or category specific expertise uh, you know, this could be the first IT system they bought and they've been buying other things before. Um, so figuring out which cause is, is difficult. Um, the key thing I did with technology, um, so I held a contract competition and I brought in a vendor that built a, a cloud application uh, known as the contract cause review tool. Um, and I wanted it to be fundamentally different from a user experience perspective for, for the acquisition workforce um, in that I didn't want to ask my user a million questions that the contract documents are supposed to be able to speak for themselves. And we used uh, natural language processing um, it, to analyze the words in the contract document or, or solicitation. Uh, Cause ideally you, you vet um, 
you vet the causes before you release a solicitation for industry, before you request proposals or quotes. Um, and, and it started out small, but it grew to include more and more causes. Um, and around 2021, um, I, I think there were some new executive orders for sustainability. Uh, the senior procurement executive at the Treasury Department uh, established sustainability and uh, minimizing climate change using the power of procurement a, as a priority for our department. Um, and I was thinking, well, how could I use the technology that I have to, to support that? And so, so one of the features uh, of this, uh, this software application is that it will extract um, products from your solicitation or contract document. Uh, and then depending on what products you're buying, that's going to drive which of those sustainability programs are applicable. Um, so, so I found it to be very helpful. And I'll, I'll give the example of a uh, managed print services solicitation. Um, and I uploaded the document to my software tool and it came back and said, oh, you're Brian Printer Toner and USDA has that listed um, in the Bio Preferred program. You can buy bio -based Printer Toner. I had no idea. Uh, and, and there's causes for that. Um, so that, that, that's basically how, it, how the cost tool works. Um, it, it, I understand that there's some proposed rules to consolidate sustainability, I believe, into one clause. Um, I, I think that will be um, more simple for the workforce. Uh, and I, I still think th there could be a benefit to having these natural language processing type uh, technology tools because uh, we, we've had a few observations that uh, one, like old causes persist for a while, like due to copying and pasting, uh, like the new sustainability clause could become a final rule, but it's going to take a while for the workforce to really understand that this is the new cause mm -hmm. and, and for them to insert it in the contracts. Uh, and then two, like being able to understand what's in the cause, um, the contracting officer can't be your, your enforcer or sheriff when it comes to sustainability if they really have no clue like what that cause means. Um, so if there's some guidance that is automated specific to their procurement, I think that could be helpful. Um, th th there is some training available to the acquisition workforce, be it at GSA and other agencies, um, but, but it's different to get uh, information like you're buying printer toner and that can be bought bio-based and that, that could prompt the contracting officer or the core to say, well, Hey, Mr. Contractor, what, what type of printer toner are you buying? Oh. Can, can, I want, I'd like to dive into the printer toner example yeah. just a little bit because I don't fully understand it. And I want to I want to make sure I understand it. I want to make sure the rest of the committee understands it too. So you have the print services solicitation and you found the bio-based printer toner. What's the step in between that the technology is helping solve? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll break down what I did. Uh, so I took a, a solicitation for managed print services. It's going to cover like printers, uh, associated supplies like toner, um, and contractor services to manage the printer program across the agency. And uh, I uploaded it to my software, which can identify applicable causes, and it can review solicitations and contracts for any like errors or omissions. And in this case, uh, the FAR Part 23 clauses for bio-based were omitted. And because we, the acquisition team hadn't been able to connect the dots, uh, that printers and bio-based just wasn't like in the top of our head, we didn't really understand. Um, we could have found, we could have figured it out, like had we, had we really researched this, um, the information's on USDA's website uh, but there's over 130 categories for bio-based products. Um, so it could require a lot of legwork and time. And normally we're under a pretty tight deadline, uh, be it the fiscal year end uh, or some other need date for the agency. Um, and, and the speed at which I got that recommendation, it was almost instantaneous. It was within a minute or two of uploading the document, I get the results back from the software. Um, and it wouldn't have taken me longer to research or, uh, you know, even if that expertise was available to me at my agency, emailing something to somebody else, hey, can you look at this and waiting for them to get back to you? Like, 
uh, that that takes time, and you know, the, the the end of the fiscal year gets closer and closer. Um, so, so the speed at which you can get those types of recommendations uh, is really like beneficial. What automation can provide. So this software contains the one thousand plus clauses that you've described, right? Is, am, am I? Am I? Yes. And so the solicitation yeah. that you pop in is just comparing what's in there against these clauses. And that's where the automation is taking place. Um, there's another key component. Um, it, it's where the software is looking at the, the words in the solicitation or contract document uh, to understand different attributes or traits about what you're buying. Okay. Um, so, so I give an example, like uh, if I'm doing a contract for Treasury headquarters, there's different security procedures and clauses compared with uh, with the IRS. Um, and so normally a contract is going to announce that uh, we're buying these services for Treasury headquarters. Mm -hmm. So if I had mistakenly included the Treasury security procedures clauses, um, it would tell me, hey, this this doesn't make sense. Your document says Treasury Headquarters. You're not including the right language, the right procedures for a Treasury Headquarters contract. Um, and, and we have other attributes uh, like for bio base, energy efficiency. Um, and, and there's, I, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, but like pretty specific like types of products that will trigger uh, particular sustainability requirements. Uh, the software tries to automatically detect those mm -hmm. by looking at the keywords in the document and, and makes Kind of an educated guess it's a yes or no whether that attribute is like true or false um and, and that's the key thing that saves user time because yeah. if i was just to ask the user are you buying any products that are available bio-based then it's like i haven't really saved the user time i'm putting the, the work on them uh but instead the software is going through trying to auto detect as many attributes of what about what you're buying as possible uh construction we, we have a few like uh classifiers or auto detected traits for like construction or architect engineering contracts. Um, those have some special causes, some are related to sustainability, some are not. No. So this is bringing me back to a conversation that we had earlier with Holly Elwood. And she was talking about how there are certain expectations for purchasing bio-based or purchasing Energy Star, but the compliance associated with those expectations isn't nearly as high as what EPA would prefer. Uh, am I correct in inferring, David, that the logics that you have set up is going to it potentially reduce the uh, or increase compliance within this space? Um, it, it, it's one tool that could help. Um... I think there's other uh, it, it tools that, that could also be helpful. Um, so if, if, uh, I could draw an analogy from some other uh, uh, procurement policies. Um, so one like the Small Business Administration has uh, uh, agency scorecards for utilization of different types of small business. And we, we get a report card, we're graded. Hmm. Um, and these are goals that we could track. Um, and, and let's see, th there's other areas, uh, category management which is consolidating our spend into government-wide contracts, uh, many of which are managed by GSA. And we can see like what percentage of our contract spending is consistent with category management, and then uh, how much of our spending is considered unaligned. Mm -hmm. um, so we're able to like track those metrics and see how well we're doing uh, and, and whether or not we're improving. Um, that, that's not as clear in the world of sustainability. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of reporting, but um, probably not as much of an understanding or knowledge among the contracting offices in terms of how well they're doing with sustainability. Um, and, and I think part of the problem is that if you're not an expert in sustainability, like it, it, it can be a little bit hard to understand like uh, what specifically should you do for a particular contract. Um, and, and it's a little bit more difficult than something like small business where mm -hmm. you can just count this many dollars, this many small businesses. Uh, it, it, it's arithmetic. Um, whereas with, with sustainability, um, you got to understand what's being purchased. Um, it, there, there is a place, it's, it's in a GSA system. It's, it's used by the whole government, the federal procurement data system. It's called the description of requirement. And this is like a free form description. 
Um, and, and so people can write what they're buying and then they also assign a product or service code to it. Um, and that can be mapped to sustainability. Um, I, I mean, it's somewhat straightforward to map sustainability uh, to the product service codes because there's a list of codes. But then if you have a dis different description field where people can write whatever they want to describe what they're buying, um, that, that's a harder challenge. Um, uh, some recent research, I mean, we haven't deployed this, but uh, I was able to create like a, an artificial intelligence model um, it, it, to take those free form descriptions and, and, and try to figure out, validate, like, is the product service code that was selected, is that reasonable? Um, it, it, the idea is not to take everything at, at face value in the federal procurement data system and to really like scrub the data, have a critical eye um, and, and be able to validate whether the sustainability reporting in that PDS is correct. Um, so that that's one thing that could add value. Um, it, most agencies have um, a validation and verification process for, for their federal procurement data system information. Um, and the FPDS data, like it's available to the researchers, it's available to the public. Uh, but traditionally it's focused on more like financial audit type information, like dollar amounts and dates. And uh, through the use of like this type of AI technology that, that can process natural language, um, that, that could be an opportunity um, to, to expand the scope of validation. Whereas I, I, I'm not aware of any agency that looks at uh, sustainability as part of their FPDS data validation and verification. I think it's, oh, we, we're going to cover the dollars, we're going to cover these other uh, data elements, uh, but there's other parts of the, the federal procurement data that's, uh, that's not scrubbed as much. So, One of the pain points that we, um, and, and let me just pause and say to the mm -hmm. subcommittee, if, if you want to jump in at any point, please feel free, just come off mic and jump on in, especially if you have a, a follow-up question, clarification, just don't be shy. But David, one of the pain points that we heard uh, from an earlier uh, focus group session related to um, the fact that when it came to these product or service codes, they're not always connected to sustainability attributes. And, it, and so it makes it really difficult as you're tracking and managing um, and, and measuring your sustainability performance to really determine the extent to which you're meeting expectations. Is, is this something that you have um, been working through in your work or is this somewhat outside of the periphery? Um, it, it, it's a challenge we, we looked at. Um, the, the product service codes, um, I think they were created like in the 1970s and like um, and sometimes they, they do a better job like describing things like fax machines versus like cutting edge technology. Like uh, the, could could be some benefits to like updates. Um, it, the, there are some challenges that like you have to pick one code uh, and there could be things like say like artificial intelligence. Yeah, artificial intelligence is being baked into all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a nexus with sustainability because AI consumes energy. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, well, do you have a, do you create a PSC code just for artificial intelligence when really, uh, it's like almost any government mission activity could have some sort of component of artificial intelligence that helps with it, but it may not be like you know the, the main purpose of the contract. So, yeah, I think one of the one of the pain points that I'm recalling related to the fact that a lot of these codes related to product families rather than the individual product, and so and so the sustainability data would get averaged across the family, and it became more difficult than to pinpoint what the true performance gains were. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there are families. Um, and, and I do have slides, uh, to the extent it'd be helpful, like uh, I could show you a few slides about the about the AI model for data validation. And it does discuss like the, uh, the families of PSC codes. Okay. All right, no slides. Go okay. right ahead. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. And I can like 
share these after. Uh, That's after fantastic. And David, I'm jumping all over the place with the question, so I apologize in part because the more you talk about one thing, it's taking us in another direction, but it's all it's all terrific. Uh, okay. Does the, the screen share look good? Yep. Okay. Um, all right, so this is kind of the problem. So when it, I, I work for Treasury, we don't have like a huge bench of like sustainability experts. We've got a few folks, but not a lot. Um, and so it's, it's hard for us to understand which sustainability requirements would be applied to our procurement. And, and um, the federal procurement data system, there's a drop down, and you select uh, one or more sustainability attributes, or, or you say that sustainability doesn't apply. Uh, so you could select recovered materials, energy efficient, bi and or bio-based, and there's a couple other values. Um, and, and like I said, we didn't have, really have a good way to validate the data, um, but now there's AI capability that, that may help or this not become like a regular recurring part of our um, data validation process, just because there hasn't been a lot of awareness we haven't published yet and all that. Uh, so key is like the ground truth, like what is really accurate, not just taking things at, at, at face value. And that was something I struggle with, because uh, one thing that's really beneficial for machine learning is to have labeled data with the answer you're looking for. Um, so I have plenty of answers, uh, you know, millions of contracts in the federal procurement data system, all labeled with whether or not the sustainability was included. Uh, I just wasn't so confident that it was the right answer. And I think you mentioned like Holly at EPA that, yeah, and there's been uh, like a few studies, um, I think like Department of Energy um, has looked at this too, whether energy efficiency requirements were included when they should have been. Um, so wasn't too confident. And I noticed you train the machine learning model on incorrect data. You really don't get that great um, results from the machine learning model. Uh, so I took a step back and those, those free form contract descriptions where the user can write in whatever they want. Um, and you know they're not constrained by the product service codes. So <laughs> if I wanna say that you know, I'm buying a, an AI system for fraud detection or something like that, you know, I, I, I can do that. I can, it, uh, I can have multiple keywords that would describe different aspects of the procurement. Um, and the nice thing about that, uh, you know, it would be very difficult to add like another database field or column to federal procurement data system. Uh, the governance board for that system is massive. It, I think it's comprised of like all the CFO Act agencies. Um, this is kind of like you gotta, mostly you gotta deal with the, um, the database structure you have, but this is a way to leverage the data as it exists, as it's currently collected by, um, the acquisition workforce enters it. I've entered it myself, and it goes all into GSA's federal procurement data system. Um, so there's freeform contract descriptions, using that to validate the selection of the product service code, and then ultimately the sustainability requirements. And some of the AI techniques we use uh, uh, were called uh, text feature engineering and principal component analysis. Uh, so basically, the, the natural language written by human contracting officials has to be translated into numbers, uh, but in a way that not just arbitrarily, like A is one, B is two, but in a way where the semantic word meaning uh, remains intact. Um, and, and, and I mean, I mentioned like GSA has got a lot of different capabilities. So not only is GSA uh, do a lot with acquisition, They've got like a center of excellence for artificial intelligence. They've got a lot of sustainability expertise. So uh, I think about maybe the possibility of like weaving all these capabilities together. Uh, and, and there may be like a reuse opportunity for a technology like this AI model. Uh, so I, I have data from the, the federal procurement data system, um, a, a little bit of data from uh, a treasury department website called usaspending.gov. Um, the, the reason I pulled USA spending data, it, which is also available for GSA contracts, uh, it has a few additional columns uh, from like the federal CFO or budget world about like program activities and object class. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you more categories. Uh, you can get beyond PSC and NAICS code and 
<laughs> there's a few more categories and sometimes there is like some sort of key information signal uh, that will relate to sustainability. Um, so I've got this screenshot. Uh, it's a lot of technical machine learning mumbo jumbo, but uh, it, basically I uh, took the, the data from federal procurement data system and USA spending, it's public data. Um, I was able to freely use like uh, textual descriptions um, and, and then I asked the AI model the question like, is this a reasonable PSC code or PSC code family? Um, and, and I borrowed, I mentioned category management. I borrowed from category management um, because they, there's a couple of thousand PSC codes and that's kind of overwhelming, like even for an AI. Uh, so by having like a smaller number of categories, by having like families of PSC codes, like for example, office management projects, pro products, uh, that was more manageable for the model. Um, it, it, what the AI is doing is looking like, does something seem like totally out of place in terms of a category? Uh, let's see, so I could give you like, like overall results and then dive into a specific example. So I, I, I used a government-wide sample of about 365,000 contracts. Um, in most cases, the AI model agreed with the PSC code selected by the contracting officer. So it suggests that that's a good quality field. Um, but 9% uh, it, it, within the sample, that was 31,000 contracts. Um, it, it, there was a disagreement between the AI model and the PSC code the contracting officer selected. And, and so like, like my suggestion, like th that could be a good, that 9% um, could be a good population to review or audit as part of data validation verification. Uh, that would be probably the most efficient way to use agency resources, whereas disagreement between the model and the contracting official. Um, and I, I think like a human review does help, uh, particularly if you've got humans with sustainability expertise, um, uh, on the right side of the slide, uh, I gave an example of like a, a miscoding by a contracting official. Um, so this is for like uh, iPads and the, the model recommended like IT and telecom products like for the end user, um, but it was coded as an office management project uh, uh, product. So, you know, it's not a sticky note like it's end user uh, computer hardware um, and you know, energy efficiency, and maybe some other sustainability attributes uh, would apply, but um, to figure out that it was wrong, it's first half would know that, hey, this was in the wrong PSC family. Uh, it should be somewhere else, uh, yeah. Are there any questions for the subcommittee at this point about what we're seeing here? Because this is, I think this is really cool. I mean, yeah, I have a question. I have a question. Um, yeah, it's yeah. really, hi, I'm Kristen, fascinating uh, and a bit overwhelming, like as I'm like digesting all this information. And so um, I guess as I'm thinking about this, how, you know, what are some of the, uh, back end or foundational things that have to be put in kind of place to be able to do this we don't have to answer that right now we can if you're going to cover some of that and then um have you thought about scale how would you scale this across to like other agencies um like i i feel like this is very you dependent versus kind of systematic <laughs> yeah uh good question so um th there are some like server infrastructure requirements and in, in, in software. Um, it, you know, I suspect that maybe like a GSA artificial intelligence community, uh, artificial intelligence center of excellence um, would have this type of capabilities, um, but, but it does require like an AI specialist. Um, and, and it's like a little bit more than just kind of like vanilla basic AI and that it's a little bit more complicated when you have these like free form descriptions that the natural language, um, uh, but, but it, like it is something that is doable with technology. Um, I, I mean, there are some gaps in that, like this is a research project, it's not integrated 
into agency validation and verification processes. Um, it, it's something that really does lend itself well to like shared services. Um, I, I mean, like myself or another data scientist um, that has the server software and skill, they can run the model and the output is a spreadsheet. It's a contract report, it's a big spreadsheet. And all the AI is doing is saying that, hey, look, 9% of your contracts, the PSC code may be miscoded, the sustainability uh, you know, may not be the appropriate sustainability requirements for, uh, for those PSC categories. Mm -hmm. and, and that's important, like, just to narrow things down. You're usually mm -hmm. not going to have staff to do 100% review, so narrow it down to uh, a population where you can take, it's kind of like a judgmental sample and using the AI to um, uh, try to find your best opportunities for, for improvement. Um, uh, yeah, so potentially uh, like, like a shared service model. Um, I, I mean, my, my scope is like, is like the IRS and a few other treasury bureaus. So uh, I'm not like scoped to run all this stuff for the Federal Acquisition Service. Um, I, I mean, there are some flexibilities like, like in the Economy Act to do something interagency. If there's another agency that's kind of set up to do something that would benefit another agency's mission, um, I guess that's a possibility. But um, as of right now, that type of infrastructure is not in place. So. Yeah, but I love that. I love that sh the comments you made on the shared services. And um, and really, like, I, I guess what I'm hearing from you is like, if you were building this three kind of components, you have your your AI specialist, you need somebody that understands, you need the technology background, and then you, you do need to infuse the domain um, principles and expertise, right? Like whether it's sustainability yeah. or contract requirements. So awesome, this is great, thank you. Yeah. David, do you have more slides you're gonna share with us? Yeah, sure, let me <laughs> jump around. Uh, right. Okay, let me do this, this is scorecard. So. This is something I, uh, 2021 data, uh, something I presented at the Federal Environmental Symposium. Um, it, it, it's fairly simple in design, um, but it does give you like an idea of what sustainability levels are different agency contracts. Um, so I told you there was a drop down of different sustainability categories. Uh, and there's also a choice that says no sustainability included in that contract. So it's simply comparing like, no sustainability included, uh, which would be the gray, or blue would mean sustainability wasn't was included. Yep. Uh, it, it's kind of the agencies you would expect to have higher levels of sustainability in their contracts. Uh, but yeah, so that you know, this was something I presented at a symposium. But um, GSA has uh, a really excellent dashboard website called d2d.gsa.gov or for data to decisions. Um, and, and so if this was like a recurring, um, like updated scorecard, uh, this could allow agencies or contracting officers to monitor their performance over time. Um, because right now, probably a lot of the acquisition workforce doesn't know like how, how well they're doing. Right. Uh, or th th this gives you a number, just like the, the report card from the Small Business Administration. Uh, it gives you metrics that gets more uh, attention on the goal, so. And implementing this sort of scorecard, um, getting back to Kristen's question about the resources that are required to implement something like this, could you can you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on what it took to get this together? Yeah, this is simpler than the AI. I, I, I mean, th this is a dashboard, um, I, I think, it's the same skill set that uh, d2d.gsa.gov already has. Uh, I, I mean, some of the AI stuff was like a little bit more like exotic and would require some little bit tougher to find skills. But uh, I mean, GSA has got category management dashboards and just making a few changes instead of measuring category management for the agencies, measure sustainability. Um, it, yeah, I think like the existing technology stack for that website uh, could do it. Um, there's plenty of there's data visualization people. Um, uh, there's a lot of acquisition expertise. Uh, you know, of course, I, I mean, they have other competing priorities, but uh, I think it's very much within GSA skill set. Yeah. 
I think so I to the rest of the subcommittee, I think we heard this statement when we talked with the category management team, the opportunities that you've just illuminated, David. Great. Yeah. All right, let's see. Back it up. Um, see, oh. So this is kind of like the, the, the timeline. Uh, so like 2021 implementing the sustainability features in the cause tool. Um, in March of this year, we, we actually had uh, like that side academic researcher uh, present a training to our workforce and some of her sustainable procurement research. Um, and, and we're working on finalizing uh, the sustainable uh, research paper, uh, it, myself and my, my co-author at Health and Human Services. Um, this is our org structure. So when you're going over my title where I work, it was kind of a mouthful, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> so we've got our, our Treasury Department Office of the Procurement Executive. Uh, and then at the IRS, we have our Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. And I'm in the Analytics Research and Technology Division. And I don't think there's a lot of, very many like contracting offices that have like a research group. This kind of like an anomaly. Um, and, and I just gave a little pretty chart example of our procurement data visualization. Um, this explains like the, the workflow of the cause tool and I was going through it verbally, but uh, perhaps seeing it will, will help you. So like the contracting officer drafts a contract, they upload it to the cause tool. And then the cause tool can either like generate the causes that are needed and also identify any errors. So, hey, you admitted those bio-based causes when they should have been included or, hey, look, we've got that, the new, all things sustainability cause, why are you using those old causes? Uh, it, so those types of things. Um, and, and this is a quote from a law review article, but uh, it, it kind of captured something I, I, I felt that um, in, in the FAR, there's a, a divergent smattering of interests. Uh, I, I know that like the FAR is being more organized so that FAR part 23, I think will focus more on sustainability. Uh, but those other requirements, I'd argue, will, will still be there, and as well as a uh, myriad of other requirements, um, intellectual property, cybersecurity, all these other areas that the uh, contracting officials are, are, are wrestling with. Um, and, and so that's why they need some sort of help, and technology is one of the things that can help. Um, so, so these were the causes that we added to the cost tool in 2021. So you see there's recovery materials, bio-based, there's EP, EPA designated products, uh, uh, greenhouse gas and emissions disclosure. Um, oh, and my software checks the FAR each evening for new causes. Huh? So when that new cause comes out, like we'll be on it, like my software developer tells me before I get like the policy update email, software developers on it because it's like, it's automated. We're just, the bot is just kind of like chopping at the bit looking for new causes in the FAR or, or, or updated causes, yeah. Um, so this is an example. So we actually like internally collect like um, really detailed data on like policy and cause compliance within our documents. Um, and, and, and so this is an example of it. So the, the emissions disclosure cause, I think it's relatively new. Um, you, you can see like green, it was like included, red, it wasn't. Um, orange, I guess the software's thinking that there's some reason that that particular cause wasn't applicable to that, that particular contract. Um, but be it red or green, regardless of the color, like uh, I'd argue that it's all a, a positive. Uh, because the green, the people in the green, this green bars already had the cause in there. Um, in the red, uh, these are still people trying to do the right thing. They're vetting their documents through this automated software. Um, they specifically requested that review by the software, uh, and, and typically they're they're going to include the the recommended causes. So uh, I think red or green is so like a like a winch for sustainability. So it's the orange where we need the validation or the follow-up, correct? 
Um, uh, well, it, let me explain what the orange is and, and the caveat that like, sometimes the software is wrong. It makes an educated guess. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some th cause prescriptions in the regulations where it's a, where there'll be an instruction like, you know, don't apply this to small business. Don't apply the cost accounting standards to small business only for big defense contractors. Uh, because that is seen by the policymakers as like unduly burdensome regulations. So if that is like the position the government's taken in terms of a public policy, um, we wouldn't want to accidentally include like owner's requirements uh, mm -hmm. when they're not supposed to be in, which would might be like a, a more simple, simplified type contract. Um, uh, so that is something that the software tries to detect. So it's called present but wrong. You're including like an inapplicable requirement uh, potentially yeah. in the contract. Thanks. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit about like like our engagement with like academia, uh, where we've re we've read some papers. Um, we we had we had a training for our workforce, and uh, and, and that led me to, to like my own research, um, like such as the AI model. Um, and, and let's see. It, yeah, so it became like an interagency collaboration. Um, as mentioned earlier, like the sustainability domain expertise is really critical uh, and, and a bit more than I knew. Um, so uh, Leo Goom, Positive Health and Human Services, uh, who, who leads our sustainability program, uh, helped me out with that. Um, and, and, I, and I helped them with like the procurement and the, and the, like the AI stuff. Um, so we reviewed like existing research, uh, and we also analyzed federal data. We were very like federally focused, be, be, being federal agencies when we look at our own contract spend. Um, and, and like I said, the federal procurement data system is standardized. So be it Treasury, HHS, GSA, there, there's some level of like standardization uh, in terms of the data and, and the FAR regulations. Um, let's see. This was like one of, one of the findings from the research. So, um, so some of the, the like the behavioral science type work that uh, Desiree Klinger had wrote about, she described it as kind of like product placement on the supermarket shelf or the liquor store. Mm -hmm. you know, the high end liquor is like right eye level, and then like uh, you know the, the cheap liquor is like on the floor or something. Um, so I give an example. So like. GSA has got SF tool, green procurement compilation. It's like a wealth of good information. And I say, okay, but this is a different GSA website. I can tell you, like, this is probably not getting a lot of hits from the acquisition workforce, like it's outside <laughs> of the acquisition people that are really sustainability focused. It's, yeah, it's kind of like preaching to the choir. Um, so there are other portals. Uh, acquisition Gateway is one of them. There's others. There's GSA eLibrary. There's buy to GSA.gov. And those are GSA websites for procurement people. And I, I think that's that's who you got to reach uh, because just as a part of a regular procurement process, websites like the Exercise and Gateway uh, are, are being used by, by contracting officials. Mm -hmm. And if your product is, is sustainability, do you have it placed front and center? Uh, and, and, and it's not always the case. Um, so it could be things like, uh, are contract vehicles that are more sustainable? Are those shown first in, in search results? Right. Do, I mean, do we know which GSA contracts are more sustainable than others? You know, there's a whole menu of different options, different contract vehicles, uh, and, and like, what's the more sustainable option? Um, it, the Gateway has uh, document templates, um, uh, as well as other websites like buy.gsa.gov. Uh, but in some cases, like there may be templates, but they may not address sustainability. They may address other aspects of procuring a particular product or service. Um, uh, so one thing to consider is could this SF tool type information really be like integrated seamlessly with acquisition gateway by the gsa.gov um, and, and similar. So you've got that mm -hmm. prime, prime product placement and advertising. Uh, mm -hmm. the places where the acquisition workforce are going. And my sense is, uh, I'll ask Boris and Stephanie, or actually anyone on the subcommittee, 
after talking with Brennan Conaway's team and the folks that he engages with, this is actually underway. This is what I recall, that they're looking at how to integrate these things. I just want to do a sanity check with others here. Is this what you recall hearing as well? Yeah, and I can chime in here real quick. Uh, Nicole, Please. yeah, Boris Sarat here with GSA to uh, yeah, DFO with this committee. Uh, Yes, uh, this, I mean, David, you're, you're, yeah, you're definitely spot on uh, with this conversation because this has been going on uh, within years and there's a couple of people that are kind of kindred souls with you that are thinking the same ways. How do we make it easier for yeah. the acquisition workforce to use, you know, we have great systems uh, mm -hmm. and that this is, yeah, this is spot on with some of the conversations that are going on right now. But that's, you know, if you've been in the IT world, it's just investment piece of it, justifying those investments, and then making sure that they are done at the right times. As you said, there's just so many competing priorities um, that they deal yeah. with. But they, yeah, this is spot on with where the conversation has gone within USA. Yeah, that's good to hear. Thanks, Boris. OK, so this is the AI. Um... Let's see. So this is a summary. Uh, so I believe y'all are thinking about recommendations. Uh, so we just talked about the, the websites. And I emphasize in the websites, GSA ones that are frequently accessed by the acquisition workforce. Mm -hmm. um, there could be a role for AI in, in validating the accuracy of uh, uh, procurement and sustainability data, uh, having a scorecard or a dashboard. Um, as far as technology, natural language processing is, is a benefit. Uh, contracting is a document-based business. And, and if you don't have like analytic visibility um, into the contract documents, you don't know what's going on in, in, inside the contract document, whether or not it's maximizing sustainability. Um, there's also green procurement audits. Um, uh, there's actually some literature from like the Defense Department. I think it's available from the DTIC, the Defense Technical Information Center. Um, apparently they had a, a, a certain parts of DOD, maybe it's the Army had a practice of like of auditing what the contractor was delivering to make sure it complied with sustainability requirements. So uh, that that could have some teeth. I mean, clauses and dashboards are great, but uh, hey, you know, you didn't give me the bio brace printer toner, you know, and, and if I'm the guy, you know, who's reviewing your invoice, then uh you know you, you would listen as a vendor so uh, you know that can be a way to like it really enforce the sustainability requirements so this is terrific david i i have a couple of follow-ups um one being about um pain points so this really connects to what Kristen was um poking at a little bit earlier um what what blockers have you had to manage along the way as you have explored the different mm -hmm automation opportunities within IRS and Treasury. Um, and I'm wondering how those blockers might apply to our own situation here. And that could be related to um, privacy. That issue has come up within our, our subcommittee, internal staff resistance. What what are you seeing out there? OK, let's see, I'm just pulling up my notes on that. Uh, let's see, privacy went smoothly. Um, it, you know, I learned about the privacy and civil liberties impact assessments. Um, uh, you, most agencies have like issued system of record notices um, regarding their procurement systems and their procurement data. Um, and you say, hey, well, I'm using the procurement system data for, you know, sustainability as authorized by federal regulations. You know, we're not using any personally identifiable information unnecessarily. Um, I mean, you do have to engage privacy and document it. Um, Cybersecurity can be more challenging, especially when you get into like AI and cloud services, natural language processing, like um, if you have to kind of like build your own technology because maybe it's not readily available to you at your agency, um, cyber can be really challenging. Um, like I have an AI powered data validation bot that's more of like, it's more towards like a financial audit. Um, but we had five different cybersecurity reviews uh, and, and that, that was pretty intense. Um, but, but I mean, necessary for, for success with, uh, kind of emerging technology. Um, let's see, like the acquisition workforce, uh, I mean, there's a challenge of like limited expertise, knowledge, and understanding. 
Um, I mean, one thing that has been like key for like any type of new procurement technology um, is really emphasizing like uh, human-centered design and user experience. Uh, so like when I had the cause tool software built, that came out of my personal experiences as a contracting officer and, and procurement uh, policy official. Um, and, and, you know, we've gotten positive feedback from our workforce about the cause tool and it's something that assists them and makes a complicated part of their job a little bit easier. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we've also gotten critiques about the software, which is like just as valuable because yeah. that uh, that helps us improve. So, hey, David, this your call software gave me an incorrect recommendation. Then I can look at it. Well, why did that happen? You know, how can we reduce those incorrect recommendations in the future? Um, and that's important. You really got to listen to like uh, the, the workforce, and that it helps them to like embrace technology. Now, we can automate certain things, but like. Um, the, the, the judgment is needed. And like I gave that example, like the audited enforcement, uh, there's a real human element. You know, I can run a bot, I can run an AI, uh, but to hold a contractor accountable, so oh, no, you didn't deliver according with the sustainability requirements in the contract. And, and I got your invoice right here. Uh, you know, like that, that's a human activity. You know, it's a human government official that's exercising uh, discretion. Uh, and I think we want an AI doing that. So uh, it'll like for CS put in uh, the contracting officers out of a job, but it's like giving them technology tools that can help them with, uh, with the many things they're tasked with. David, did you partner with an AI firm to, to help you think this through the different, the different applications that you've been using? Oh, uh, sometimes I have, but uh, the sustainability AI model uh, it was something that I, that I did myself and we, we did purchase like some commercial like auto artificial intelligence software in my agency uh, that kind of compensates for you know, the, the limitations I have is like not like a full-time data scientist as, as someone who's a procurement official doing uh, some data science uh, and, and that you know you still need to have some knowledge of AI but uh, it it, it makes some things easier, like having those freeform descriptions, translating them into like a AI understandable format. Like it does some of that for you, which which can be very complicated to do with uh, writing code. Uh, so the the pre purchased software did. It, it, yeah, yeah. Like, like I am able to write some code for like basic AI models, but uh, some of the more like complicated aspects of developing this AI model for sustainable procurement. Data validation, I found it was easier to do with the auto AI software, uh, which is more graphical and, and it didn't require me to, to write code. So kind of like lowering the barriers for, uh, I think they call it like citizen data scientists or something like that uh, uh, to solve these type of problems. Kristen, I see your hand up. So hard to unmute. Thank you. Um, you know, what, what kind of intrigues me here is, and I'm going to lower my hand, is that even if we, uh, uh, we may not, I love this whole thing, but it may take us, like, how do we get started? There's a lot of learning from, like, the outputs, even on a small scale, which I think could really have a profound, um, like, using that to communicate the importance, like, how many, um, old clauses are persistent. Did you know how many new clauses aren't even making it in? I, I love the printer services example, like so creating that into like a storyboard that we share across government to why this is important, because like a lot of people will be like, oh, is this really important? Yeah. Um, but I think it's awesome. So I, I, I'm also as interested in like the negative outputs, making those a positive for driving the community to move towards this. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. And if I may, like, uh, suggest considering the the Federal Acquisition Institute at GSA, because um, one like, contracting officials had to take a lot of training, like it's required to keep their certification and ability to sign contracts. So like getting the continuous learning, like training credits, is like a strong incentive. Um, and, and there is some sustainability training on there. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, if, if if like some common mistakes or like lessons learned that, that could be beneficial. Because one thing to say. Here's an overview of our uh, of our 
program, uh, but it's different to say, well, here are the mistakes we've commonly seen with, with contracts and things that are maybe common mis misconceptions or misunderstood. David, if we were to think about this um, strategically within GSA, just based on what you know and what you've learned in different application areas, and GSA were to roll out a pilot to consider this broader opportunity space, based on your knowledge of procurement, where do you think the best place to launch a pilot would be? Um, I you know, I, I think like there's a lot of opportunity with uh, with IT systems acquisition, uh, mainly because I feel like uh, th there's a lack of guidance. Like if I want to buy a laptop sustainably, okay. If I want to do a building renovation and improve energy efficiency, like, like that's straightforward. But um, mm -hmm. the, the system stuff is more complicated because uh, you basically you've got facilities, servers, and software, and even the software, uh, you know, like I'm a bad programmer, my code is probably less sustainable. Um, it, it, it all plays a role, but, uh, you know, how would one select the most sustainable IT systems vendor? Uh, and then once the, the contractor's hired, like, how, how do you evaluate, monitor, or, or, or surveil their sustainability? Um, things like, so when you manage servers, there's something called FinOps, which is like financial optimization or something. But it's also like, if you're not, you don't want to like unnecessarily run up your bill with like Amazon or Microsoft or whoever your cloud provider is, because uh, it costs you money, but it's also like you're wasting energy. Um, so that's something that like uh, the IT organizations do. Um, the, there are some papers, like I think I've seen come, some come out of like Germany, I believe, they talk about techniques for data scientists to um, make AI algorithms more energy efficient. Um, so, so that type of thing is like in an emerging area. And you know, could there be a, a template, uh, the evaluation factors, a contract statement of work or statement of objectives? Um, uh, I, I haven't like seen it before, but I think like the different expertise around GSA um, uh, you know, could produce tools that could be used throughout GSA and the other agencies would use them too, I think, so. That's great. I am, I, I am um, wondering about the research and, and this stuff that's ultimately going to be in, a, it sounds like it's going to be publicly available, the research papers that you've developed some already, but some are also in queue. Um, what, what are your what are your plans for publication and dissemination more widely? Because I can say, at least from my from my vantage point, I would love to get access to these. Uh, it, yeah, so the the research is like currently under um, uh, agency review, um, but yeah, we we plan to have it like like, like open access. Um, we have like there's like a preprint preprint research repository. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're not necessarily concerned about like the most prestigious journal or anything like that. Just kind of like getting the research out there. People could uh, just click a link and see it and not have to kind of hack through a paywall. So, yeah. And is that preprint pre repository already available? Uh, no, nah, we do have to go through like the, the, the agency review before okay. we, we, okay. we preprint the <laughs> machine. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We yeah. want access yeah. at the point it's available. Stephanie, your hands up. <laughs> yeah. And a quick question, uh, and, and David, just thank you so much. Uh, you're just, I'm so impressed. You're very well versed in, in GSA's resources and websites and technology. Uh, my question is, during your research, was there, um, Anything as far as costs, commercial off the shelf products being developed? Do you think that each agency is going to have to build their own? Am I still there? Did you did we yeah. capture that? You came right back in at the point that uh, each agency uh, uh, built uh, its uh, own. Uh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Cots versus building your own. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, it could be both. So, I mean, for the call software with natural language processing, um, it, it, it is 
a commercial software product that, that, that I buy through you, a, a small business. Um, the, there's a, organization, a component in Department of Homeland Security that's used like the same firm. Um, but there's also like a handful of other vendors that, um, that are in the private sector that, that specialize in like natural language, like AI powered call software. Um, the, 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 uh, AI model for like, uh, procurement data validation, uh, it's, it's, it's government developed. So it's not like proprietary to like a vendor intellectual property. It's like, uh, it, it's government, uh, you know, I may have to talk to my leadership about like, like what the best method to like, uh, to share the best like collaboration model, but, uh, but it's not like somebody's trade secret and uh, it, it's like a government product. So um, uh, yeah, so probably a, like a mixture of bo both. I, I, I've done both sometimes like government folks. I, I, you know, I've had GSA folks develop code and then I've reused it and, um, and, and vice versa. So it's usually just like whatever's like the easiest, most efficient path towards like get into your goal, whether you go commercial off the shelf or, or, or government built. So. Thank you. Would it be possible to follow up with you to get information like the specific names of these off the shelf products that that have been utilized in different ways? Uh, yeah, yeah. You send me a reminder. I got a market research report that will that will like name vendor names. And yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm taking a look at our list of questions and asking what haven't we covered as yet? And 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 one one's top of mind because you had your recommendations. We've talked about a lot of stuff, a, a lot of items that were part of your slide deck, but also items outside of your slide deck. I'm I'm wondering whether there are immediate policy changes or recommendations uh, that you you would advocate for to advance sustainability and federal acquisition. Uh, I mean, not not any like regulatory changes, but I, I mean, there are things that uh, GSA could consider internally. Like, uh, the, the, there could be a policy on like the the FPDS data validation and verification, uh, and and it would be worth considering whether uh, to amend that so it would include sustainable procurement data validation, not just kind of like a financial data validation. Um, the like the sustainability information, the GSA acquisition websites, um, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it, just something uh, along the use of like emerging technology, uh, be it mm -hmm. automation or AI, or like uh, I have the information I share, maybe like broaden the imagination about um, you know new types of procurement technology that could have a benefit to sustainability. Uh, because if you're just kind of used to doing things a certain way, like most people are not going to think like, oh, I should use AI with text feature engineering right. to figure out whether my sustainable procurement data is correct. Maybe they didn't know that was an option. Um, so, so just some way of like, uh, including like the, the planning activities that this type of technology is an option. Do we want to do it? Can we somehow incorporate it as part of like the procurement technology that's used at GSA? And, and you mentioned this um, GSA Centers of Excellence, and there's an AI focus within it. Is that, did I get that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's at least one group, probably multiple groups in GSA that have a lot of like AI expertise. Um, and and that's, that's important because you really need something like that to, to run an AI model that uh, uh, if I give you source code and data for an AI model and you just, uh, not familiar with hands-on doing AI, it's like uh, you're going to struggle. But uh, someone like that would have experience and servers uh, uh, where they could run AI models, and, uh, and and in this case, like the output would be just like like a spreadsheet that could be used and say like a quarterly data validation and verification. Do you know anyone in particular within these centers of excellence that we should talk to? Uh. Yeah, the technology transformation service. I, I mean, there's some groups that they, it's hard to uh, say off the top of my head, but there's some groups that like advertise that like if my agency wants to hire them to like build out like a uh, like an AI capability, uh, then then we can do like an economy act uh, interagency agreement 
uh so, so that that would they're advertising and that would tell me that they have got these type of capabilities so and nicole um i may know someone that is in tts that could help i'll reach out thank you thank you well i i think i i've run out i i'm just wondering what else you would like to share about your experience and the opportunities ahead of gsa as they think about automation and making this process as frictionless as possible? Um, let's see, a little tidbit. Um, so Acquisition Gateway does have something called um, GSA eBuy, which is a portal for sending requests for quotes or uh, solicitations to, to GSA vendors. Mm -hmm. um, it has uh, a, I think it's, I believe it's publicly accessible is an open API or application programming interface to the document library and eBuy. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would allow one to look at um, uh, GSA solicitations posted on eBuy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of similar to some like published research by the energy department where they looked at solicitations um, and, and whether or not they included sustainability requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, nice thing about uh, APIs or application programming interfaces is that they're machine readable. Mm -hmm. um, so that opens up some opportunities in terms of like uh, using AI to look at a document for something like sustainability clauses. There, there may be an existing system. Um, something like that could potentially be a good home for a pilot. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to solve it for like every procurement. Um, in the world, this is going to be like, like a subset of procurements, um, but this would give you existing technology infrastructure and a place to go uh, that, that already exists that, uh, it, yeah, so. It, so it was, one, way, one way to approach it is to look at the category of IT services. Another way of slicing a potential pilot is looking at a, a particular role within GSA for procurement, the acquisition gateway. Uh, yeah, and I'm saying it's like you need a system. If you want to do AI or robotic process automation, yeah. you need you need a system. You just can't build that stuff on top of nothing. So that's a system, and uh, it, it includes solicitation documents. I mean, not every federal solicitation, not even every GSA solicitation, but a subset. Um, and from the little bit I know about like the technology stack, uh, the fact that there's application programming interface where you can get to the solicitation documents, um, that that may be the type of thing that say at the technology transformation service, they've got their AI servers. Uh, API is a means for like an, say like an AI server to communicate with the servers where eBuy is. Okay. So Stephanie, I think this connects with your potential contact, correct? Yes, it, it, yes. And, and I'm going to reach out immediately. That sounds great. <laughs> it came out really slow, <laughs> but, but we understood you. I, I want to pause for a second and ask if there are any other questions from the subcommittee. This has just been tremendously informative. Daryl, did you have any any questions? I kind of transfer to my computer, but I'll, I'll keep it on my phone. <laughs> Um, I did have a question. I was trying to formulate it. Um, so I'm just going to spit it out and um, allow it to allow David to figure out how best to answer. But, you know, during your, your chat, you talk a lot about how um, the metrics around small business procurement was so much simpler, I guess, or the the process is a bit more advanced uh, than where you are now, you know, in sustainability procurement, you know, it's, it's harder to, it's easy to count the numbers or so mm -hmm. forth. But, you know, I, I I know we have some small business procurement people on the committee and I want, I almost like to kind of hear from them because I, 
I also believe that there are some certification requirements and and other um, I don't know regulatory requirements in the whole small business world that um, maybe makes it a little bit more complicated than just as the number. So I was I'm just I was just trying to figure out. I struggle with this whole idea of making procurement people sustainability specialists. <laughs> and I, I know in the small business world, there are small business specialists who you guys, and I'm sure you do too, you rely on to help with small business procurement. And I just wonder if, if you guys have, I mean, I know you have sustainability specialists, but they just appear to be embedded in the procurement process as, as opposed to something separate. So again, I, I couldn't figure out how to how to frame that question, but you kept mentioning it, and I kept thinking like, mm -hmm. huh, how can I how can I get this question uh, the way yeah. I want it? Uh, no, I, I, I mean those are good observations, and uh, I, I have some thoughts. Hopefully, they'll be helpful. Um, so one uh, small business, like we have, like government advocates that that are embedded in our procurement process. Uh, so we have some like in the contracting office at the IRS some of the treasury level and also the small business administration, um, you know, and they'll ask you, so well, what do you mean you want to sole source this to a large business? You know, aren't there small businesses that can do it? Why don't, why don't you set it aside uh, for small business? And, and, and they have specialized expertise and there could be like, um, like the FAR is not a comprehensive list of small business regulations. Like uh, the, the SBA regulations are pretty like voluminous, um, and, and we would go to them if there was like a complicated question about um, like a small business size status regulation or something like that. Um, so, so, I mean, we do have like some procurement policy in us with some sustainability expertise uh, who can be asked questions, but that's different than someone who does like affirmative proactive like advocacy that like all contracts of this dollar amount or all contracts of this type must per agency policy get reviewed by our sustainability advocate. So advocacy is different um, and it is something that that can be impactful um, that could help with the fact that yeah, most contracting officers are not sustainability uh, experts. You know, if someone just said, that, hey, we need to include these energy efficiency requirements on what you're buying, um, you, you know, they that, could just be accepted, you know, it, it would be different than saying, oh, no, you can't use, you know, the vendor you use for 20 years and you, you need to use these other vendors. And, you know, it, maybe that's something that uh, a lot of contracting officers would, would be open to. They got to go through a process, they get the feedback, they incorporate in their acquisition, they, 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 they move forward. Um, uh, so, so that, that is something to, to think about uh, should there be like a small business review and advocacy type process uh, like for GSA procurements. So. Actually, you you opened up another uh, mm -hmm. idea for me because I hadn't thought about it in terms of the advocacy part. Uh, yeah. That That is significant in the whole small business world. Um, and in fact, it's probably even more significant than than what they're able to achieve sometimes, but it, it, it's there's yeah. a, a big emphasis on that, and and it's not just always kind of haphazard. It happens because there are folks out there advocating for it, and people out there trying to find um, small business enterprises to to do some work. So uh, that's some it gives me something else to think about. So thank you. Yeah, and I mean, there's like the small business uh, scorecard and like agencies know like what um, their total spending of small business or like subsets like small disadvantage or service disabled veteran owned. So uh, agencies know, and, and I mean, there's even been like some OMB incentives that like, um, uh oh, your bonus is linked to, uh, the executive's bonus uh, is linked to small disadvantage business spending. So that that really like, gave, gave it a big boost, but even if it's not explicitly tied to executive bonuses, like ha having it like a, a metric that's tracked. Um, and like agencies have a structure, like I said, treasury and IRS. Um, and, it, you know, that would be a metric that treasury could look. It's like, well, geez, IRS, you know, why aren't you doing better with sustainability? 
um but but they they need like a dashboard or or a tool or something like that gsa has got the federal acquisition service uh and so for someone that's at like the executive leadership and kind of like the policy oversight level do they have a tool to say that oh just gsa's region is you know not doing as much sustainability as this other region in gsa um it, like that could, that could be pretty powerful and you know maybe there's not that type of clear actionable like analytic information available uh, due to a lack of a sustainability scorecard yeah i like that and i think that the whole point here is small business procurement is so important to the agency that they are willing you know to measure it they are willing to kind of penalize you know or reward you know for it and it's i guess it's it's probably in the regulations too. So, I mean, it feels to me that sustainability needs to rise to that level mm -hmm. if it's going to be taken seriously. That's it. I think that was a great way to end our conversation, Daryl. David, I really, <laughs> really want to thank you again and again for mm -hmm. the time that you took to come and talk with us today. We'll be following up on a couple of points to try and gather additional information. Um, but you have given us a lot to think about, and I want to thank you um, for joining us. Yeah, um, yeah thanks for having me, and uh, I'll share a certain agency with the acronym DOD. Uh, th they rejected my paper after I decided I wanted to talk about sustainability, so, so I'm glad I found uh, th th this committee and a good uh, outlet where hopefully the research will be like uh, helpful and actionable, so yeah. <laughs> Most yeah. definitely. You're, you're welcome here anytime. Yeah. Yeah. David, David, may I ask um, the, yeah. the slides that you presented today, yeah. can they be shared with us? Is there uh, any way to share? Yeah, can I email them to you, Stephanie, for distribution? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, you're welcome to stay with us, David, and hear the remaining conversation. We want to be respectful of your time. So if you want to sign off, that's okay, too. Um, at this point, we're going to shift and move to a Jamboard to discuss some key takeaways. And Kristen, it looks like it might just be you and me. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I don't have my other computer here, so I'll have to try and jam on the phone. Or I, may oh, just tell no. you what I, I may just tell you what I think. <laughs> Let me let me uh, put the link in the document or in the chat. <laughs> and I was going to ask Nicole if maybe you wanted to uh, take a quick pause and maybe uh, go to cut public comments now. Oh, that's a great then, idea. Yeah, and then yeah. we would. That's okay. a terrific idea. Thank you, Stephanie. So, okay. so yes, I, this is a great moment to invite um, any members of the public if there's something that you want to add to the conversation, we would love to hear it. Any comments or observations that you'd like to share? Okay, so um, Kristen, were you able to access the Jamboard? Are you here? Are you here with me? I'm still here. I'm here, but I don't know if I don't think I'm going to be able to access. Let me try. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. So I can, if you want to pull it up, I, I think you and I can talk through a little bit. Well, gonna... or you can put your items in the chat and then I might be able to lean on either David or Stephanie to help with putting those chat items into a sticky. Would that work? Sure. And part of the reason is that I want to get my stickies out here too, and I want to ensure that we have documentation of everything that that impressed us so much about this. Okay. And then afterwards, I need a tutorial on how you create those stickies so quickly, but we can do that <laughs> offline. <laughs> control C and Control V. <laughs> Daryl, this is impressive. <laughs> All right. All right. So, well, so yeah, just um, take some time and pop in the chat the items that that captured your attention, and I'm going to do the same. Okay, I am looking for the link that allows you. Did you 
It's it's in the chat, Daryl. But I was looking you, in the chat. If you just sign back on, it may not be here anymore. So let me let me copy yeah. and paste it and and put it back in. Oops. Let's try that again. Give that a try. Okay. I think that works. Great. And if you need translation, because I'm not the best typer, just we can talk through that. I put uh, Kristen's comment in there. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh -huh.
All right, Nicole, I have to save some gas for my, my meeting tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I think these are separate vehicles, Kristen. I'm so all fired up here, and I'm like, oh, I got to save some energy. <laughs> I'm all done. That's it. That's all that's in the tank. <laughs> Stephanie, I will have my other computer tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> no problem. It was a great session, Nicole. Really awesome. Well, Boris and Stephanie arranged an amazing speaker for us. What was interesting to me was to hear that data, that privacy was not a concern for them because that has popped up as an issue that we've discussed in prior meetings. I mean, he did, he did not emphasize it, but he did seem to mention there were some, there were some initial concerns around it, but, but maybe they got around it or I don't know, but. That's right. Nicole, I'm I'm gonna have to drop at ten of just for another commitment at five. Okay, I think I'm um, at the end of my notes. Okay, yeah, but just if you guys are still going, I'll just I'll just quietly drop. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's the end of it for me. I I just like to take some time and have an open conversation about some of the observations that you've that you had through this. I kept asking. There were a couple of things that were really hitting me. One that he's part of an, he or he engages with this analytics research and technology division. Stephanie, does GSA have an equivalent sort of division? 
Um, I think the center of excellence is, okay. is, is all I'm aware of right now. And, and I'm glad that you asked because I did reach out to a gentleman and he is uh, going to reach out uh, to the point of contact for us as Terrific. well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I'm looking for where I put this in my notes. Oh, I just kept asking myself, do we need a task force on AI to really explore the opportunities internally that might exist? And um put some dedicated attention around um around those opportunities i think we as a subcommittee are never going to never going to be in a position to understand all of the all of the um well we don't have the expertise to really think through the different technology opportunities but there are people within gsa who could populate a task force um to look at some of these issues more directly and i think that given some of the issues that David raised, and gosh, he, I think he more than anyone thus far really started seeding this, this garden of opportunity that might exist to, um, to really help automate things within procurement. The fact that with the statistic that really jumps out in my mind was that 91% of the different contracts that he scanned were validated by AI. Like there was con congruence across this. It was just the 9% that were off. And so imagining if you could reallocate resources towards that 9% nine, 9 to help improve, um, to improve because it's machine learning, the learning within the machine, what that would mean within GSA and other agencies. Um, I just kept imagining how this could, could uh, help advance and accelerate the intentions of embedding sustainability more broadly. And, and and that was a question that I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to take too much away from his presentation. But I, I really wanted to ask, you know, knowing how the government works, um, just a little bit more clarification on are we having to wait for a commercial off-the-shelf product or yeah. is each agency going to have to do their own, you have their own and build their own. Um, and, and that's something that I was um, curious to know in his research, what his thoughts would be on it, on that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And then, but Stephanie, and one of the things I would kept thinking about though, is also we could, you know, part one of our recommendations on IPS is creating these a pipeline of challenges that GSA could consider, Nicole. And, you know, we we talked about reaching out to you and Luke to say, you know, these challenges could also support your subcommittee work. Yep. So might want to consider like embedding. And so what we're going to do is try and give them like some samples. This would be a great sample to say like AI and contract and procurement, because you know, the big law firms or people are starting to use this and we could run a challenge we could recommend a challenge on what the pain point is uh so we can work on that if you want i mean i think that might be a good way to get a lot of information with it's already out there right yes yes okay so i'll take that i'll carry that over to tomorrow's <laughs> meeting and let me just mention we were in a, a meeting uh with uh jenny um uh the Robert? other day and and, mm -hmm, and they did a challenge for sustainability is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. epa does epa does one um and she sent us the link and i'll make sure to send that to you you guys so you can see uh the type of uh the individuals that won the awards oh. um and they've been doing this for quite some time uh, as far as innovation and things as it relates to sustainability. So I'll make sure to forward that to you um, when this meeting is over. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking myself how this, how what we see here, because it's, for me, it's raising more questions. It's solidifying this notion that we need more centralized expertise. We talked about the, um, the, um, draft recommendations that were with that will be moving forward uh towards our uh, December meeting but really we need the draft recommendations sometime in November uh, so they can make their way through the process for me I think that 
it is this conversation has solidified the notion that we need a little bit more information before we move forward on a recommendation within this within this tech tool space and the use of AI. But I wanted to get your thoughts on this um, before I sort of put this on the next steps phase. Or is it a case that you see some immediate items that we might be able to move forward here? I think I think there's a lot of information here. Like his his thing was so amazing that helps us build the case on why AI and machine learning um, can and should be applied to the procurement um, challenge, the, the workforce challenge. And like just using that printer services one as yeah. an example, like I'm almost envisioning like an infographic, right? Like showing like, um, I'm just uh, like a piece of paper that's a contract document, but then like, uh, persistent old clauses, new clauses left out, right. number of products that, you know, have like, you know what I mean? It's almost like a diagram to show how complex small business requirements, whatever is in like one solicitation to, to demonstrate to people how complex this is for a uh, procurement professional and why, you know, engaging them with a tool doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be all encompassing, but it's, it's massive. So anyway, I kind of wax poetic there. That wasn't. Stephanie, well, oh, go ahead. I was gonna let, let Daryl go. Oh, oh, well, I was just gonna piggyback on what Kristen said. I, I think there, what I heard was maybe there could be some smaller steps mm -hmm. and um, with, with the use of software. I mean, I like this idea of when he, when he made the comment about how certain liquors are at, at eye level, you know, some things kind of, they should pop up, you know? So when you, when you start the, the process, certain things maybe should pop up that help to make the decision easier, but you may have to dig, dig even more. Um, I, I just, I think I, I, yeah, I, I think the tool is is important. Having some sort of tool, I, I can't say if it's an AI tool, but but, but clearly um, some kind of machine driven software that. Yeah, and like Daryl, like in software, um, software developing software, you know the the tools like they use a tool called term called Copilot. So like the person who's doing the coding still is the master of the coding, but you know, this co-pilot will come in and be like, that's not the most secure version of this code, piece of code, right? Here are your options, you know, so that, and it's almost, I envision it would almost be like that co-pilot type concept assisting the um, procurement professional, you know, versus it going out into a block box and returning something, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think we're ready to have them like they, we're still leveraging their expertise, their judgment, but they have something that is assisting them with helping to keep up on the most current things, the most accurate things and things like that. It's super fascinating. I just wanted to let you all know that I added the uh, EPA link to their um, Green Chemistry Challenge Award um, oh, nice. in the chat. Um, and also um, I think that once if we can get someone from the center of excellence, it will help tremendously because it will give you a sense of direction of where GSA is going with AI and procurement, if they're headed that way at all. Right. Um, and then we'll give you a little bit more insight yeah. on where you should take it, how far like you should that. take it. Mm -hmm. I love Stephanie, it. Yeah. I think that's like the next set of, for our next public meeting, that's who we should be talking to. And if, if you and Boris could help facilitate that, I would be immensely grateful. Okay, not, not, not a problem. And, and if we can get them earlier than the next public meeting, would that be even better for, it, as far as the formulation of the, your document? I don't think, I think that we're, we're okay with saving this recommendation for the next set. Okay. Um, 
And and to that end, I, I did want to give so so in that regard, we have time. And and the reality is we have a public meeting, we have October, and I think the acquisition workforces public meeting was canceled next month because of the mm -hmm. Thanksgiving holiday. So we won't have one until after after our yes. big, our full public meeting. So I, it, so it's going to work out just fine. I wanted to give an update to the subcommittee on what's happening with the draft report. I'm, I'm going to put in the chat just to remind you of, of where we were the last time we talked. Here's our jam board of the, the items we were looking at. And Anne and I have been working to consolidate these and pull them together in a written document. We have an initial draft together. Anne and I are going to finalize it between the two of us, finalize our thoughts, and then share it to the rest of the subcommittee so that we can start really getting your thoughts on, on how these recommendations look. So the first recommendation is related to third-party training and, um, and the type of, what do I want to say? Um, the, what, what, optimal third party training would look like. Our general recommendation is to put out a request for information from third party training vendors around climate training um, so that we can get a better understanding of what the broader landscape of climate training looks like um, that GSA could consider. Uh, Jeff asked us about the third party training specifically. So and then once you've identified the suite of third-party trainers that are out there, how would you select a suitable third-party trainer? The second area relates to experiential learning. Uh, it's something that this subcommittee believed to be a really effective form of learning. And um, then asking ourselves, what elements of experiential learning do we think are really um, most important for GSA to consider? And then the third priority area for recommendations was looking at the data standardization and developing training on existing uh, data tools and uh, systems. That's on slide three. Um, so the text is coming together and we're developing uh, text related to next steps as well, where we will talk more about the potential for developing knowledge and understanding around AI and how that might really help automate um, GSA. Uh, that'll be the next suite of recommendations. And also thinking one of the items that keeps popping up that we're hearing about, Daryl, that you really dialed into is this notion of internal incentives within the acquisition workforce. How do you reward individuals that are going the extra mile and to create those internal incentives uh, for individuals to wrestle with this inherently complex field of managing sustainability alongside all of these other expectations. It's too much, it's too much, it's too <laughs> much. It's a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot. <laughs> So my hope is, Daryl, you'll, you'll you and the rest of the subcommittee will uh, be receiving um, some uh, draft language next week that you can start reviewing, and we as a subcommittee can come together around how we think this should move forward. And with that, that's that's it. Unless there's something else that anyone else wants to raise about the activities we're taking on and and what we're doing and what those next steps are. Is there a public comment period? We've already done that. It oh, may we, done it. we did that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think it's just us chickens at this point. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Good. Because Stephanie, I'm sure, and I know Nicole has heard, heard me say this several times. I, I think, I just feel like we're putting a lot on the procurement mm -hmm. people. And we're asking them to be experts in an in another area that some will embrace, as we see with David and others. But when you when you start looking at across the system, it I just keep saying if this is important, then they they should treat it like they treat the small business world, treat it with that level of importance have a dedicated team 
of folks who that's what they do. That's that's the support that they provide. Now I realize the regulations set all that in place. You know, we're just there's a difference between policy and regulations. But you know, it was important enough to be a regulation. And I'm and I'm gonna agree with you. Um someone who, you know, prior background is procurement contracting. Um but that was one of your recommendations to GSA to put an advocate, a sustainability advocate, yep. and they adopted that. Now, will they take that next step and then it will become a program office or they'll put it in a specific office that's already being assigned? Um, that's more to come, but that suggestion has been taken by and will be by GSA. So um, so your concerns have been well received. And so I just want to put that out there. Okay. All right. All right, Nicole, I'll leave it to you. If you don't have anything else, I will That's adjourn it. at this time. Currently, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.